Okay. So welcome everyone to the final episode of the Future of Architecture, where we have Gita and Jess sharing their insights on ecological sustainability. Um, as everyone knows, I'm Akil, the host, uh, coming from an architect, and Pranjo, also our co-host, who will be representing the students. Without further ado, we will get into it. Jess, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Wonderful to meet everyone. <laughs> it's great that uh, you are here at this moment with us to share your views on sustainability. But just before we begin, can you please tell us a little bit more about yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Jess Schulschink. I'm the director for the Sustainability Institute. We're a nonprofit trust based just outside of Stellenbosch in South Africa. And we've been a part of a vibrant eco village, Line Dock Eco Village, for the past 20 years. Um, it's a great honor to have this conversation today with Gita, who's actually been involved for much longer than I have um, in the, the work and in the space. Um, yeah, so that's my, my research and my practice is a lot around corporate sustainability. Um, and the work that we do at the Sustainability Institute is really around learning and transformative learning. Jess, what, what you just mentioned now sounds almost like the entire ecological syllabus for architectural students. Anything in sustainability and, and uh, holistic architectural design really sounds like it revolves around um, everything that you said. Can you just tell us a little bit more about um, the, the regenerative work that you're doing or looking particularly at uh, focusing on childhood or ECDs or early childhood development and, and, and those kind of topics that you guys are working on there? Yeah, so we work across a range of programs, um, starting with the youngest, we uh, have an early childhood development or ECD program that uh, serves about almost 50, 60 children from the local community. Um, then we head through into primary school, high school, FET, and we have a long standing partnership with Stellenbosch University delivering their undergrad and postgrad degrees in sustainable development. Uh, so sometimes I joke, you know, you can do everything from ECD to PhD, um, <laughs> but really um, a lot of our work is, is trying to think about how we learn and towards what end. Um, and so that's where questions of be being ecologically regenerative or restorative as far as possible, social justice, um, and bringing a lot of that into the education we work, uh, work we do across the ages. We also have a research and advisory portfolio. So a lot of our graduates go on to lead work um, researching and advising others, whether it's in government, business or civil society. Um, and we try and practice what we, what we teach and what we research. So we um, endeavor to run our own facilities as sustainably as possible. We're very active in food systems. So we have a small farm. Um, yeah, lots of, lots of projects and things on the go. Yes, in fact, I've had the, the honor of actually um, visiting the Sustainability Institute, the, the premises. And I must say that uh, what you guys are doing there is exceptional. Um, and, and upon entering the premises, generally, the, or the one thought and the one idea that comes to mind, um, especially for someone who does have some sort of um, knowledge on what sustainability is, is that you think that while well, this is really um, sustainability in practice, but then it also begs the question uh, of what is sustainability? The, the present concept of sustainability seems to have um, this general tendency that it's, it's about going green. Um, and and for, for many reasons, perhaps it's a good thing and, and not such a good thing in some senses, but can you tell us more about what your view is on the idea of sustainability? Yeah, I think um, it's an interesting word. Um, you know, there's many ways to interpret it, but sometimes if you were to think about it in, in its most basic sense, to sustain something is to keep it going. Um, and maybe that might let us think it's about keeping things the same or stopping things from getting worse. Um, and I think that we fall short when we, we don't take the opportunity to use sustainability as a way of or a lens of seeing the world and seeing the possibility of living in ways that are more generative. Um, and for me, that's both in an ecological sense. So how do we live in ways where we can have a net positive impact as a result of us being around? And that might be really hard to think about at the moment if you think about how intensely um, implicated we are in a very carbon intense economy, uh, energy system, the way we build, the way we move, even the way that, you know, the food that we eat. But actually, if you think about, and if we were to draw on inspiration from many natural systems, 
most species, as a result of them being a part of an ecosystem, they provide a set of generative services. Um, and so I think humans, we're quite rare in that our, our behaviors and our patterns of activity are generally highly extractive and impactful, um, often in very negative ways. So sustainability offers us this a way of thinking about how could we, through our actions, live in ways that are ecologically generative. I don't know if it's always possible to restore to the pristine environments we had before, but how do we have a much lighter touch? Um, and can we, as a result of being in a space, uh, be a part of the solution rather than the problems? Um, and maybe we'll speak about it a bit later, but it's in inextricable for me from social justice. And so um, when we think about resources and who has access to them and what that means in terms of um, the potential to have a quality of life, as well as the huge impact that humans have, um, sustainability is a deeply social issue. And it, it matters um, both what we do for future generations, but also how we think about equi equitable distribution for current generations. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done in that space still. Undoubtedly there is, but just looking before we get into more on, on social justice just looking at the idea that you mentioned of likely um, touching the earth how light do you think we can get hmm I think it might be a good question for Gita who's a, a very experienced architect and has had a lot more experience in the space um my work you, you know a lot of what we do is is trying to look at for example how large organizations can shift the role that government can play, how can we shift our food system. So I think when we stuck in the same patterns of thinking that created a lot of these problems, we might um, be limited to thinking about small margins of possibility, um, incremental improvements. Uh, but we, I, I think we have to get a lot more radical in the way that we think about the energy that we use, the way in which we use it. Um, and ultimately, I think this begs a question, which is what is quality of life? Um, and I. I know myself, I often confuse that with having a lot of stuff and using a lot of things. Um, and I, I don't know, I, I feel in a lot of conversations recently, COVID has offered us a way of reflecting on what really matters. And uh, I think we have to challenge head on this uh, issue that we have as a species around hyper consumerism. If you think about 20% of the world's population are consuming more than 80% of the world's resources on average. So at this point in time, I don't, I'm not sure that it's a challenge of we don't have enough resources. We're simply using them in highly inefficient ways that I'm not sure improve in quality of life. And there's very inequitable, inequitable distribution of that consumption. I quite like your choice of words, um, Jess, because often I think mm -hmm. perhaps the usage of the word equal and equitable is often confused. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I specifically like that. Um, so leading on from all of these ideas you've discussed, how do you, or how would you say that these ideas are embedded in the work done at the Sustainability Institute, which you are the director of? Yeah, um, so I mean, I'll be the first to say we're not uh, completely neutral in our activities. We certainly still have impacts. We're not entirely on renewable energy. Um, or even if you think about renewables, there's a life cycle of impacts that are associated even with solar um, lead to the environment. So yeah, we, we net, we're not um, net generative, but we try and be deeply conscious of the water, the energy, um, the resources we bring on site, the way in which we reuse them, um, and really trying to ensure that education is part of that lived experience every step along the way. So being able to see the solar panels that are on the houses on the in the village, being able to um, participate in the grey water and the sewage recycling systems, composting, growing food. It has a massive set of educational benefits as well. And I think the more that people can see that this is possible um, and in many ways desirable, I, I hope that has a ripple uh, through the system that we can see that sustainability is entirely possible and uh, in many ways uh, enjoyable. That's quite true. In fact, um, if you listen to uh, the there's a lot of talk, um, particularly if you're looking at um, contemporary uh, architects, one of them, uh, of course, is Bjarke Engels. He mentions this idea of hedonistic sustainability. And one of the things he mentions is that uh, sustainability perhaps is just a, a preferred way of living as opposed to, um, say, this kind of shift where it's, you know, you, you've got to be 
so conscious that it becomes a little bit uh, para, mm. you become paranoid. So mm. you, you, you've mentioned that it's you a preferred acid way. Green. Uh, sorry, Gita, did you say that again? You become acid green. Yes, <laughs> acid green, that's right, that's right. So um, just this idea and, and these ideas that, that you spoke of now and, and, and talking about um, a better way of living, a better way of living for people results in a community that thinks towards um, such things. If a community can work towards this together, um, I would imagine we'd have a large scale impact on, on, on actually seeing these ideas come to fruition. So it seems as though community is a central role in the idea of creating a sustainable future. So if that is so, then what are your opinions on social sustainability? You did start with it, but let's get more into that. So, I mean, if you want to be really blunt about the whole situation, the, the earth would be quite fine without us. Um, it's really ourselves that we need to figure out how to save from ourselves. And so there's no ways in which we can do this work without being uh, kind of addressing the very human elements and humans, we, we exist in community. Um, so I think it's both the challenge, the fact that it is the human species that is creating a lot of these challenges um, and it's the opportunity. Um, when we can collaborate, so one of the terms we often use in the sustainability literature around issues like climate change or inequality, we talk about these being wicked problems. So it's a problem that no one person or group of people created by themselves. Everyone is affected by it. And no one person or group of people can solve it by themselves. And so inherently to address these wicked problems, we, we need collaboration. We need all the different kinds of skills and intelligences and passions to be a part of the solution. Um, and that's why I get really excited about what working in community means. Um, it means shifting away from seeing yourself as um, apart or separate and somehow being someone who can come in and tell the community what to do and how to do it. I think that's an old way of thinking that's increasingly being shown up to be highly, just, just doesn't work. Um, so when we belong and participate in community with an open mind and an open heart, I think we can open ourselves to the richness of learning and the diversity of skills. And those skills include skills that don't sit always in formal um, codified knowledge in the uh, disciplines or careers that we used to. So we need the architects and we need the professors, but we also need grandparents. Um, our grandmothers of our community know so much better than anyone else what the real needs are. And when we can co-design and um, kind of co-implement um, that type of collaboration, I think will give us a strength of design um, and an endurance for that design to really remain responsive. And I think that's one of the things I appreciate most about the Lined Up Eco Village is it's a very diverse community yeah. of different socioeconomic and racial backgrounds. It's messy. Um, so if you can imagine a cross section of South Africa living in one village ne next to each other, door to door, um, it's exactly what you think it might be. It's, <laughs> you know, it's challenging. Um, but it's deeply real and I can't imagine staying anywhere else because you're alive to figuring it out, um, but there's a commitment to figure it out together. So I think, you know, um, we can talk about community in a very theoretical sense. I get excited about what community means in practical ways, um, and that includes just showing up. Um, yeah, and belonging to the community that you're already a part of. Showing up is, is it can say at least 50% of the solution sometimes. So um, I, I think that your, your views and your opinions are, are generally widely held at this stage uh, in, in, in human development uh, are, are widely agreeable. I think many of us can agree with, with much of what you said. So in your opinion then, what do you think the future of sustainability holds and how do you think this could be achieved? Before yeah, we move to um, that, I, may, may I just please, add to what Jess was saying? Yes, yes, please. Um, what's very interesting about the way the Line Dock Eco Village was conceptualized was that it was to set up a living and learning community as a very intentional community where people chose to be there because they were part of this exploration mm -hmm. of living in diversity and learning to be more sustainable and caring as a society. And it's taken a lot of courage and a lot of um, 
commitment by people who have made that choice and Jess has made that choice to actually live on site and be part of that community. And I think that that is a very important distinction because you're not talking in theory, you're engaging at an everyday level, both through your life, through the engagement with the community, through the engagement with the children whom I can see just has a huge passion for and a lovely relationship with. And then also through the academic programs and the kind of interaction and exposure that that context actually provides people. So, um, you know, I think there are very few places like that in the country or even maybe globally, there, there are a few more, but in the country, I'm not sure that there are any other places that offer that kind of experience. I, I think that's, that's quite true because in being there myself, I saw a lot of this um, uh, actually happening myself and I, I was highly impressed that such a thing actually exists. It becomes um, a case study for someone to say, you know what, it's been done before, so we could do it again elsewhere. And I think it's extremely important that such um, initiatives and such projects do continue working. Um, so Jess, what do you think um, the future of sustainability holds, uh, particularly coming from someone who has, as Gita's mentioned, lived on the site, experienced a lot of the social dynamics as well as the more, uh, we say, pragmatic um, energy constraints? Um, what would you still say the future is? Would you still have an optimistic opinion or would it be perhaps a little bit more watered down? <laughs> Um, you know, so this decade is increasingly being called the, the decade of action or kind of um, it's a, a decisive decade we find ourselves in and, and people are saying there's a significant call to action in this decade. We have the awareness and the knowledge to know that the trajectory we're on is not just unsustainable, it's, it's deeply undesirable. Um, a lot of the philosophies or paradigms that many of us were born into have promised, uh, you know, improved quality of life, uh, wonderful conditions, and for many people, for most people, that's not materializing. Yet we have the resources, the knowledge, and the skill to design and act differently. And so in this decade of action, I think for me, it's a massive call to action to each of us individually to roll up our sleeves and say, who do I choose to be? Um, am I going to sit on the sidelines and have commentary saying that, um, wow, things are really not going the way that I want them to? Or am I gonna apply my unique passion and interests and be a part of figuring out the kind of future that I wanna be a part of, that I wanna live in? Um, and so for me, I think the future of sustainability is about um, deep, deep personal participation. Um, grappling with the tough questions, challenging paradigms. Um, you know, a lot of what we have taken for granted or the narratives and the stories we've been told are busy crumbling. And so that can be a very unsettling time. That can be a time where we feel like, you know, there's no foundation, there's no certainty. Um, you know, democracy in the US, it didn't quite work out the way we thought it was supposed to. Um, if you look at pandemic and, and, and global pandemic, what um, COVID has destabilized for all of us is a sense of certainty and planning. And if we look at the intensity of our ecological crises, it's, it's really not insignificant. And so I think that, you know, there's a beautiful, um, I'm trying to think of the author, but it's, it's uh, she talks about stay with the trouble. And for me, a, a part of that, the future of sustainability is figuring out how to stay alive in those liminal spaces without shutting down and becoming an absolute pessimist um, or denialist and not being naive in our optimism either. Um, so I know that's a very uh, intangible answer, but I think um, for me, it's the future of sustainability is going to be deeply personal. I think that's that's more than enough we need to take um, because if you do reflect uh, in your personal capacity about the effect that you have, um, if you start personally, I think it begins to manifest in ways that you could make tangible on a larger scale. So uh, I think many personal attempts um, beget the best solutions at times. But just thank you for, for your um, for your, your wise words and your word choice and, and for all of the work you're doing as well, because it is highly commendable and admirable. So I'm going to shift over a little bit to Gita and to ask Gita about the architectural interpretation of what Jess just spoke about, because these ideas practice on a social sense um, as Jess is doing it, as, as, we, as we can see, or as you will see just now in the presentation that will be shown, it's possible. 
what facilitates such social interactivity would then be the architecture. And that's not necessarily a very easy thing to get right. In fact, taking the intangible or at least the actions that human beings um, enact, it's very difficult to always take that and translate into something that successfully facilitates social interaction. So Gita, thank you for joining us. Would you, would you like to please give us a, a little intro on yourself as well before we begin? Okay, so I have the um, honor of being the second black woman to graduate as an architect in this country. Oh, wow. Uh, the year that I attended Aki School at Fitz University was the first year that they opened it up to black students um, in, a, in a larger uh, set of numbers. There were 100 black students at Fitz University in 77. This was post 76. Wow, the first that, part of that, my... Uh, Impressive. Sorry, Gita, I just must say that is very impressive <laughs> and, and, and something to particularly take note of. Uh, they don't yeah. have an applause button here at this moment, but uh, I'm giving what, a hand what, on. What, thank you. But why I'm sharing that is that I think that our histories make us particularly um, sensitive to the kinds of things that are going on. So, you know, my history lessons at uh, school were all about African nationalism. Then I get to enter university and I'm part of the black consciousness movement. And I understand that I will not be able to operate as an architect unless we actually find a way of overthrowing the government. Because my future as an architect was to design separate toilets for blacks and separate toilets for whites. And I was not committed to doing that. So I was very deeply involved in the struggle. I then decided to travel and, and backpack through the whole world and work in India for a couple of years. And I became aware of the Indian struggle and the Gandhian movement. And the Gandhian movement was very deeply um, engaged in issues of sustainability and issues of um, sustainable economy. So that was a crash course in really understanding development. I worked for an NGO that was going through a 10 year review of its work. And I was allowed to sit through all of that. So I really did get a crash course in sustainability and, and development, and then subsequently worked on a project to generate a, now I realize a green set of solutions to upgrade 5,000 households in 40 local villages. So that was kind of my grounding. When I came back to Cape Town, I realized that we would have to focus on development. So I was involved in the founding of an NGO that helped people in the struggle for land and, and housing. And so I understand that the political was very important in terms of even the policies. The next chapter of my life engaged um, me as an architect in um, still the continued struggle for land housing, um, intervening in public architecture. And this was now post 1990 after Mandela was released. Um, and beginning to understand that actually sustainability was quite a core issue as well, particularly when you saw that one side of the road where the blacks were was brown and the other side was green. And how did we begin to understand this? You know, parts of, country, of our country were destroyed in terms of its viability. Um, so I took a break when my son was born in 1998, and that's around the time that we engaged with the Sustainability Institute in the land of Eco Village. And um, so that started me on a journey towards really deeply exploring what sustainability was about. And one of the big things that influenced my life was the work that was done through the Schumacher Institute and um, the publications that they uh, had created called Resurgence, which started in the 70s. And I made it my self-directed kind of learning exploration to read decades worth of all of those journals and everything else that could move. And then, um, I realized that actually my next chapter in my life was going to have to engage with sustainability as deeply as possible. In, around about 2010, I did a review of the work we were doing around competitions and buildings, et cetera. And I said, no, no, this is not enough. We're still destroying the planet. We need to shift scale. And we need to start looking at cities and city development. I have always in my professional life been engaged across disciplines between architecture, urban design, planning, and environmental management. And I think that that play across those different scales and across different disciplines is really, really important. Um, so that in a nutshell summarizes me professionally. I think what's important for me is that I'm both a partner, my, my business partner and my life partner um, um, is, some, is someone that has really tracked my life journey with me. Um, 
community is very important for me. Um, I have also taught from time to time and I continue teaching even through my practice. Um, networking is critical for me, so I have quite wide networks um, in various places and they're important to understand what's going on and learn from. Family is critical for me and ongoing learning and research. So that in a, in a nutshell is what drives me. And the passion that I have is to really make the difference to the girl child that is the most left out in our communities and that any child in any of those communities that are underserviced at the moment or have not had that opportunity actually can have a life of hope and be able to progress into the future where all those opportunities become available. So how do we do that? So it's not just an architectural pursuit, but it's a much wider pursuit. And so now I engage at the level of city design in the, in the work that I do. Gita, your, your words are very moving and very impactful. Um, and I think that um, as um, upon entering into the campus uh, of the Sustainability Institute, I can see it manifest in many ways. Um, and, and, and that uh, if I could call it a personal attachment to this project, I can see it derived uh, into the architecture. Um, to note and, 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 and to, to make as distinguished as possible the challenges that you've had to overcome, uh, particularly in, in, uh, in, in an apartheid era and in an era where you saw a lot of uh, exclusion and oppression and, and to come out of it still having um, a view of the world that is not just positive, but also realist. And also, um, if I can say it in another way, it's, it's as if you, you still have the fighting spirit to change and to fight against the things that it's not the apartheid government anymore, but rather it's perhaps other um, wrongdoings and other forms of tyranny, uh, whether it's by people or whether it's by history, whatever the case is, that is something highly commendable. And, and I do um, appreciate you sharing your, your, your history and your background and your identity with us, um, because identity is, is, is a very strong driver of, of change. Um, so, so, so leading on that and, and talking about your manifestation of, of your personal ideas, um, that's not a very easy thing to achieve in architecture, although it's something we're trained to do. But what were some of the processes that led to the development of the, the Lindoch Eco Village uh, and the multi-purpose hall? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? So um, Dick Eindhoven, who owned the piece of land that the Lindoch Eco Village is located on, um, was engaged in a discussion with Mark Swilling and Eve Annika, who are the founders of the Sustainability Institute. And they had invited us to think with them around what would be possible to design an eco-village. And I said to Dick Eindhoven that I was not willing to work for any old body unless they, asked, they answered my terrible questions. <laughs> so I wanted to know from him why he was doing this project. And he said he was doing this project or he was exploring what is possible because he wanted to create a place where everybody could feel free to be fully themselves. Okay. And that was amazing. That's why I said, fine, I'm willing to do this. But it gave me the opening to really push all the boundaries. <laughs> okay. so, so there was this incredible conversation that was going on where Mark and um, Eve were involved in the Spear Estate around the sustainability aspects of agriculture, the uh, tourism business, the restaurants, uh, the recycling, all of that kind of stuff. At the same time, they were exploring notions of a leadership institute, some of which um, I think thinking also came from uh, the Schumacher Institute. And at the same time, we were exploring these notions of the eco village. And I had done extensive reading and assessed all the sustainability projects in South Africa just shortly before that. So all of this started coming together and Dick had made a promise to the community that was um, going to school in uh, temporary buildings across the way that he would someday create a new school for them. And so the idea was born that we would create the school as the heart of an eco village and the school would be available to not just the farm worker children, but to everybody. And that that um, would actually become the kind of core and the focus of, of what's there. So very early on this engagement between the notion of the school, the notion of the Sustainability Institute with the other leadership institute, which then evolved into the Sustainability Institute and what this building would be started coming together. And at the same time, I then started calling on the networks 
that I knew and, and so did Mark and E. And we found this incredible set of people who equally in their own pursuits were exploring sustainability. So like the biolytic uh, sewage system or Chris Posma, who's a Dutch person who was involved in eco villages long before we started even thinking about it came and, and we sat in a room and we did not leave until we thrashed out what we believed could be possible. So this went on for days and weeks. At the same time, I was doing some short teaching modules at UCT and I set my, pro my students a project to, um, to design the Sustainability Institute building. And um, they came up with this amazing set of solutions or one, uh, uh, you know, a group of them were looking at the international school in Harare, which had some really amazing solutions using rock stores and passive design features, etc. So my students were delivering some really fantastic lessons that I then further developed and I connected with Arab International. And we said, we don't have the budget to do what you want to do, but let's start from first principles and we'll design it sensibly from first principles. Um, so that's how we engaged with all of that. And then we said, okay, we've got to um, explore sustainable materials. And I was given the task to put together a little guidebook for my office around sustainable materials. L little did I realize that this would become like a lifelong passion and, and engagement. And out of that was born a wider network of people that challenged us to think around what was possible. And I think it began to feed into the work that Mark and Eve were doing. So when the uh, building was built, they launched the first um, Sustainability Institute course in eco-design. And I was asked to, um, um, to, to be part of that uh, offering in, in the first round. So it was a really happy coincidence of really an amazing range of people who came together and this idea of creating an intentional community at the heart of which was a learning institute, which was about leadership and about uh, uh, thought leadership um, and engaging very deeply in what this meant. How could you take this little piece of land, five hectares of land in the richest area of South Africa in the Winelands, and how did you start thinking about it as a transformative thing in its very nature, in its very being, in its everyday being? So that's what started that process. And my partners are also remarkable people and all the team that I worked with. We moved our office to the site and we lived, ate and breathed the Sustainability Institute, mud architecture, mud and lime plasters, all of the stuff that we did there. It was quite an incredible journey. Oh, that, that is um, a truly immersive experience in the, uh, in, in, in the creation of the architecture. So I think yeah. your process was, if, if I can, um, if I can interpret it, it, it sounds as though uh, the process was really born from the construction and the construction was born from the process. I think the entire idea, it seems very intrinsic and uh, inherent to the ideas that are created there. Just um, before we, we, we talk a bit more on it, the construction of it, the actual physical construction of it, was that as immersive a process as well? It was. So, you know, I have uh, the, the good fortune to really have the most difficult clients and the most difficult buildings to <laughs> renovate. And this was the ugliest, most god awful <laughs> shed in Stellenbosch, which was used for rave parties and, and um, a parking garage for vintage cars. And it was really a mess. Um, and the, the eco village used to be um, a pleasure resort for people who came from more remote farms to Stellenbosch to, to come and stay. Um, so, you know, it was um, the engagement actually allowed us to really look at this building and say, how do we think about this building and transform it with virtually no resources? We had very li limited resources. So we also became part of the fundraising team wow. and, um, and we engaged widely and, and networked and we begged, borrowed steel from every soul from everywhere. And, and built this, this building. And what was fantastic was to have people like Marx and Eve Annika as partners who then also were busy developing the relationship with the university. So um, grad and, and everybody that came on board was willing to really engage. And I think what's important is that because it was such a powerful vision that we were exploring, everybody came on board and everyone contributed. And so we, we experimented, we shifted courses as we were going. Um, and we learned as we as we moved along. Um, the design was robust. It was very beautiful. We made some mistakes, but we learned. 
and we fixed it and in the end what came out was really inspiring so and and all the cons it was a dream project the consultants team was so inspired i don't think any any of us slept at night we were so excited uh, that's definitely what i can see and that's what also quite quite intrigued me on this particular um project because i i feel as though a lot of that that attachment a lot of that sense of um, ownership over that project has really come through. Um, so talking about ownership and, and, and these ideas, the, the building itself, um, which has been created through this, this very layered process, um, how has the ideas of the Sustainability Institute uh, or, or, or this, uh, all of the evolutionary values, how has it been embedded uh, into this particular building? Um, could you maybe describe that a bit more? So, you know, what's interesting about the way in which the building was designed was that it has an internal street and then it has a bunch of spaces. Um, and, and, and a lot of them are now used by the Sustainability Institute, but on the periphery, on the, on the ground floor edges, are spaces that were also used by many um, organizations that were doing green things. So it became an opportunity to attract people to, who, were, who were involved in, in green solutions. And then the leadership courses that were offered were offered to executives and potential change makers and, and, and emerging leaders across the board. So the, the education model that the SI was offering through Stellenbosch University um, as part of the SI offering uh, was remarkable in that it actually created a new mode of learning where people came from different disciplines, different age groups, different um, experience profiles and jointly could engage in something like an eco-design course. Um, and you would have like the university professor from um, UCT and you would have a bank executive from a bank all in that same course. And we would then be grappling with this idea of sustainability from all these different viewpoints. And so what emerged was um, a broader understanding of all the different dimensions of sustainability that needed to be um, engaged with. Part of the process of learning was that um, initially was that people were invited to be early every morning, you would go out and you would either plant um, the gardens, the veggie gardens, or you'd be part of the hacking process of the aliens. Um, and you would rub shoulders with the little kids who were from the farm workers, children in the school or whatever. As you were engaging with all of this, you were rubbing shoulders with all these people who came from these different walks of life, cultures, creeds, and, and statuses. And so it was an incredibly inspiring experience of the living and learning experience. And as you were doing this, and as this course evolved and progressed and grew, the housing began to be um, unfolded because initially we just built some of the affordable housing components and over time people bought the plots and bought their own houses and the homeowners association then really created the space for people to have their own living and learning experiments around sustainable materials, sustainable design, the interpretation of what it meant to be living within a community. So the kind of eco-village structure, the planning framework, the urban design framework was robust enough for all this play to unfold. And the SI's program and the institutional arrangements that were structured around the relationship between the Eco village and the SI and the school allowed this interplay of things, which created for me one of the richest palettes for, for living and learning. So anybody who went there would get a slice through this entire spectrum of experience the veggie gardens, the biolytics, the nutrients that come out of the biolytics that gets used for growing vegetables the um, biogas system that subsequently has been installed, the experimentation with solar PV systems and the, the live monitors that you would experience. So every time even I go onto the site, I learn a new thing around what's going on on that site. So, I mean, this was the richness of that, right? And, and at the same time, the program has been engaging with what does it mean to engage with the surrounding communities, to, around, mm. to engage with the notion of sustainable farming, or, or ethics or whatever, you know, so, so yeah, amazing, really, really amazing. You so mentioned, really, it, so, sorry, sorry, please continue. I would encourage um, your students and, and maybe you would like to do a piece sometime on just that learning program and how yeah. it has evolved, because I think it's quite remarkable. 
No, undoubtedly that would be, or not would be, that is on the list of things um, sure. that, you, that students would engage on because it really does talk about um, ideas which we study in a very, very real sense. Um, yes. And, and, and you mentioned just now about um, community and urban design. Um, who and what source the values of the urban design architecture and the ongoing expression of, of uh, Sustainability Institute uh, and, and the Lindock Eco Village? And I have had very varied experience of traveling and working around the world. And, um, and I had done quite extensive thinking and research around just the notion of eco-villages. And so when we engaged with um, Mark Swilling, Eva Annika, predominantly uh, Dick Eindhoven, et cetera, we had these robust conversations with, with what uh, a place could look like, how it could operate, how it could work. But fundamentally, we had to bring our skill as designers to really think about where we drew the line. So for example, should the institute and the school have a fence or not? And we decided consciously that if this was going to be the heart of the village, it must be the heart of the village. There should be no fences. And it became a big fight with the, with the education department that there would be no fences per se, but there would be very distinct boundaries that would be expressed or that use the terrain and use the planting and use the definition of edges. Um, so like that, you know, there was this very deep engagement with how this would all work and how you navigate all those different needs that, that the different groupings would have. So what we had to do is we had to structure the space. We had to understand the planning and other uh, supports that could be brought to bear and also the institutional arrangements. So we kind of put forward candidate institutional arrangements because that's part of our training and, and what we actually can offer. And we also have people on our team who have diverse training. So even though one of our people is a planner, she also has some legal training. So we could draw on this from the kind of team that we have and make that offering because we were thinking forward into the future and saying, okay, so what would facilitate this? And we we just called on everybody we knew to, to pick their brains and pull the stuff together. And so that's how it evolved. And I must say that it took a lot of courage and persistence on the parts of uh, Mark Swilling and Eve Annika to go and negotiate for the subsidies, negotiate with the education department, as Jess does now, you know, every step of the way you are ongoingly negotiating resources, boundaries, agreements, you know, so it's when I say living and learning, it's an ongoing on, it's like, it's like in a marriage, you're ongoing <laughs> negotiating all those different things. You just don't call it that, but you are. <laughs> and, and that's what you do. Um, you that uh, yeah. Gita, before we continue, that just how would you say you handle such um, such such challenges of this ongoing? Because, like, like Gita is mentioning, it is a fight every day, if you can call it a fight, or at least an effort to ensure that this place is maintained and still running mm -hmm. and, and and still continues without collapsing on itself. Can you tell us a little bit how about you handle that? It's, it's um, you know, sometimes people ask what our funding strategy is, and it's it's a hustle. You know, we get every cent we can from government. Um, we fundraise, we generate income. So, you know, it's, it keeps you on your toes because there's so many different moving parts to all of it, but it's incredibly um, creative work. And I think the thing we saw through this COVID period is the strength of long-term partnerships. And so when you enter into values aligned um, generative partnerships, not only does it sustain you financially through tough periods because there's a kind of a buildup of trust over time, um, but it also sustains you in these creative and necessary times with ideas. Um, with the reciprocity of, of thinking. So I think, um, you know, there's, it's a hustle, but the partnerships, the long-term values aligned ones are incredibly generative. Um, and then the other, you know, I, I really enjoy the work of um, Meg Wheatley and she talks about creating islands of sanity, um, kind of resigning yourself to the fact that you may never achieve an, a, a perfect or ideal outcome, but that the journey is worth taking um, and it's who you take that journey with that matters. So I would say the community that I get to be a part of, um, having elders like Gita who guide us, um, and kind of finding joy in the in the creativity and the hustle um, is an amazing life source. Uh, so one I'm very grateful for. It's a lovely question. Thank you. <laughs> okay, because I see you use the word hustle. That's hustle culture is is, is a thing. <laughs> so, yeah. um, <laughs> yes, um, talking about hustle culture. Um, 
one of the things that I see born out of it on your on your site, um, if I even if I just scroll scroll through my LinkedIn feed, I see you have a number of courses that you are currently offering. Um, I, I think that um, it, it was about carbon footprints and reducing carbon footprint. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, so like Gita mentioned, we offer you know a number of courses over the years. At the moment, we've got a few on the go. So there's a, quite a technical course in carbon footprinting. There's an introduction to business sustainability. We've got immersive learning journeys on deep ecology, reimagining education and African wisdom systems. So you'll see there's quite a diversity of um, short courses on offer. Uh, all of that's available on our website. Um, and it's a lovely place also, you know, our different platforms just to stay posted with the work that we do. Thank you, Jess. Thank you. Uh, yes, and if, I, if I can add, uh, I have a very... Um, uh, deep love of the Sustainability Institute. I was on the, I was the chairperson of the board of the Sustainability Institute for many, many years. And what I heard ongoingly, whenever anyone hears that I'm in any way connected to the Sustainability Institute, was how amazing the course was, how life-changing the course was that they went and did. And literally, I hear this all the time. So well done, Jess and your team. You guys are really doing a great job. But, but that's the thing, is that it is so inspiring because it really connects you to a future that's possible. It really, it really it does. And... and um... From, from the, the experience that I've had and, and, and whatever I've seen, uh, I, I can see that there's, there's immense value in, in such um, modes of knowledge and education. And um, talking about modes of knowledge and, and education and um, African wisdom, um, Gita, what do you believe the role of such developments uh, to be in relation to the way we reinterpret and reinvent the conception of city? Because we have had past notions and perhaps you could say almost more Eurocentric versions of what a city should be. How can we, or how are you from a first principles perspective um, engaging with this idea of, of city, but from an from, from a Afrocentric perspective or at least a, a non-Eurocentric perspective, if we can say it that way? Do you know, um... For me, what's really important and, and, and part of our urban, urban design thinking is that we put a lot of value on the respected institutions that become the core of our societies. Now, there are many that exist in all of our societies anyway. Our schools and churches and, and places of worship are respected institutions, but they're not necessarily moving forward into a future that we desire. So I think that part of the challenge that we have around thinking about the future is how do we generate those kind of forward thinking uh, institutions or the institutional capabilities that can begin to seed these respected institutions such that they become the upholders of these values that we need to very quickly um, share and embed and deepen because they already exist in many places, but deepen, as Jess was saying, you know, we must really um, rediscover those values that are inherent in our communities and, and, and hold, uphold them and, and, and also make them available so that we're both taking our new learning, but also not losing the wisdom of the past and, and making that available. So for me, placemaking becomes very, very important. I think that when you go to the Sustainability Institute, it was very important for us that it's not a formidable building. It's gotta be a building where you feel at home. I really took Dick Endhoven's words to heart and our team did. So you've gotta feel at home, you've gotta feel comfortable, but you've also be, gotta be inspired. And how do you do that? And how do you conceptualize the making of places and spaces and cities uh, but in a way that also those institutions come to ground. And I think we have an institutional challenge at the moment because we don't have enough of those kind of institutions that are visible. I think they're there, they're not visible and we don't have enough of those. Now, if you think about the paucity of um, um, institutional space making in township areas, for example, you know, you get communities who really struggle even just to hold a meeting because there's nothing available. And so you've got this tremendous source of wisdom and strength and resilience, 
but they're not able to live out their lives in terms of what they can do. And we need to be able to create those spaces for that self-expression. I mean, it's heartbreaking for me when I work in a community like Kosovo and the women are running these amazing programs, looking after the children, using their own resources, running soup kitchens um, and, and you know, uh, encouraging hip hop classes and soccer between the shacks. What's wrong with us as a society? Why can we not address this need? You know, so, so I think we need to really become deeply aware of this and see how we can begin to intervene in these spaces. So both reworking existing spaces, our urbanization mm. in South Africa in the larger cities has largely happened already, but it has really landed in the most um, difficult and, and unviable patterns. And so we need to think about placemaking and space making from that point of view. And we also need to think about the restructuring of place and spaces in the future. Um, and how that makes it more livable. I mean, I've been involved in township projects for about 15 to 20 years now where nothing has shifted because we just don't have enough land in Cape Town. And so, you know, how do we think about this? Uh, we're not going to be able to solve the problem in that place. We're going to have to think, we're going to have to stand back and say, okay, what gives? And how do we, how do we create that? How do we unblock that log jam and begin to create some movement and shift? And how do we find those leaders so if I can just toot my own horn, yes, part of the process of what we've been working on for, for quite for the last 15 years with like-minded people who come from diverse backgrounds, but share this kind of sense of that we are stuck at the moment, in, in Cape Town particularly, but in our four major cities, our four secondary cities, we are really stuck around the problem of unlocking and rethinking the special apartheid city. And so we published a book called Two Billion Strong, which looks at a regenerative approach to um, making, South Af uh, making African cities. And those conversations have come from engaging very deeply in creating creative conversations with people in the health, education, governance, um, um, procurement sectors, and really saying, if we were to think about this differently, how do we think about it ecologically, especially structurally, um, and then we've also engaged with a very interesting network of people um, called the Regenesis Group, who have worked across the, the globe, but, but are largely based in the, in the United States. And they also tap into very deep wisdom around people who understand you, you have to start really looking deeply into the DNA of the earth. So, you know, it would surprise you to know that a place like Lintuk or a place like our West Coast's DNA is actually subtropical. So if we think regeneratively, we have the ability to nudge our ecosystem into a more subtropical state than a more arid state. How do you begin to do this? You can only do this at scale, right? That's, that, that's, that's like, I, I wasn't yeah. aware of those things. Yeah. So, so this is not stuff that's very easily available. I had to really, I, I was very fortunate to come across these people and they have come and helped us think about these design, the systemic design thinking and, and how we think about these places. And as a result of that, we've been invited to work in places like the Niger Delta and um, mm -hmm. you know, think about the extension to the city of Cape Town and various other places in, in Ghana as well. Um, and, and we have to start thinking at that scale because really, I think there were a couple of core mistakes that we made as we evolved in city making. One was our water system, the second was our sewerage system, and the third was our banking system. Those yeah. are at the core of the ills of our society. And if we don't find a way of radically rethinking those, then I think that we are really in a hiding to nowhere. Just on that note, why do you state the banking system? Because the, the how financial systems work uh, favor the rich to get richer and the poor to stay poor. Okay, I was just checking if uh, I was on the same page as you. <laughs> Gita, now drawing on the wealth of knowledge you've just expressed and what, what Jess has mentioned, what would you then say the future of architecture holds and how can this be achieved? I think it's valid to work at any scale. I think that there's always a need for really good and green architecture as well. But we can design so-called green buildings, but if we haven't taken care of the core, sorry, and the, and the policy environment, is the other thing, because our policies are embedded within a um, industrial system, which mm. um, is about separate and divide. It's not holistic. Um, 
we've got to um, address those wider scale opportunities. So rather than think about a building, think about the solutions at a precinct level. And fortunately, our green building tools and things are beginning to engage with that somewhat now. It's taken time. We've got to rethink radically the way we think about living, working, playing, the way we work, the industrial systems of how we separate work from, 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 um, from living is I think also a problem. And I think COVID has taught us a lot around that. We've got to decouple our definition of growth and well-being. You know, if you're going to really build a fancy building and put in lots of glass and then put in the aircon, really rethink that. Uh, it's not necessary. Um, we must focus on regenerating communities um, and, and the, the sense of, um, you know, the planetary consideration so that communities are encouraged to understand their role as um, stewards of the, of the, of the planet. Um, we've got to rethink and shift radically our understanding of key resources like water. Virtually every city in the world is going to be struggling with water, whether they have abundant water or not, because the cost of processing water is too high. I have my Indian uh, uh, friends and, and, and academics who are engaging in quite a lot of those kind of debates and discussion as well. I think energy becomes almost a secondary issue because we can deal with energy a little bit differently, although the carbon impacts are what's driving the energy conversation. Waste, materials, biomass, habitat. We've got to most importantly design the future from the future. We've got to start radically reimagining the highest and best future and design the future from the future. Um, so yeah, you know, it's got to be based on this notion of our best understanding. And it's not, it doesn't exist yet. It exists in pockets. Mm -hmm. But how do we best vision um, the highest and best version of human nature, the planet and communities in action? And from that future, hold ourselves and the communities and the people we work with to that possibility of that future. Because if we continue focusing on the stuff that's worked in the past, it's just going to take us down a rabbit hole. So we've got to think right. We've got to redesign the, the frameworks and the policies that we work with. It will be difficult. It's like fixing a plane while we're trying to fly it. <laughs> we've got to create those enabling environments at all of those scales. For example, I've just done a sustainability framework for a very important site in the city. And there's tons of water that comes out of the basement that could be cleansed and recycled. The city has a policy that says we will not recognize that water as sustainable water because they have a fear around how they will manage that. That's very real, but we've got to rapidly overcome that because that, that water is being pumped into the sea. And this is going to be a community of about 3,000 households. How do we put that water into the sea? It's impossible. We shouldn't be doing that. So our policy is not supporting what's possible technically. We've got to ensure that the parts and the whole are headed in the right direction. And most important, all of us have a duty to be aware of, to engage and to shift the context. We've got to challenge paradigms as Jess, Jess said every day. We've got to challenge all those paradigms. And we've got to, we've got to, we've got to move with courage and we've got to act. We will get things wrong, but hopefully we'll get more things right. Well, I think it's the will to act that's important. And, and like you said, yeah. hopefully we get more things right than wrong. But even if that's not the case, it's better to start trying something and find, well, maybe we shouldn't go down this route and to do nothing and still postulate. Uh, Gita and Jess, thank you very much for joining us. I don't want to take a lot more of everyone's time, but... Gita and Jess, you provided an insight, not only from the background of practical realities and involvement, but also this layered experience of years and years of actually working with real problems. It's not just an action that you've done, but you're also acting with advice, knowledge, and a link to the past. And I think that's very important because it is you acting now with a contextual and situational awareness, which perhaps to some degree is not very evident in those who are coming through the system now. Uh, by that, I'm not um, sort of underplaying uh, us in the, in, in the younger generation by any way, but uh, I'm trying to say we need to draw on those knowledge, on that kind of knowledge that you have, is what I'm trying to say, is that there's a lot that we can get from you and a lot that we have to house. As Jess had mentioned, um, those who have come before us, I everyone has had value. Gita, you there? I have a very, very favorite um, North Star. Sorry, did I interrupt? No, no. I have I, a very actually, favorite North Star. I, I actually had, uh, I think it broke up there. So I didn't hear you, but please go ahead. 
I have very, very fun North Star. It's no point rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, which is already sinking. You've got to find <laughs> the life rafts. Quite right, quite true, quite true. I, I quite like your, um, your take on it because in fact, that's, that's really what we have to do. Um, Gita and Jess, thank you for all of the work that you're doing. And thank you for, for, for showing us a part which perhaps we maybe only once knew in theory, um, now you've shown us the practical reality of it. In fact, I, I, had, I always mentioned to the students that there's no point in being at either end of the spectrum, only practical or only theory. You have to be in between because that's where the action happens. Um, yeah. So what I'm going to do is we will take some questions from the students so that we won't take up much more. Generally, we have a little bit of a break, but I think we should go on to ask the questions very quickly. Um, let's call on Pranjal. Pranjal, who represents the students. Pranjal, please take us to your people. Tell us what they say. Okay. Uh, first of all, Geeta and Jess, both of you, uh, whatever you spoke about, I was just listening with rapt attention. And, uh, just like Akil mentioned, like the choice of words and basically this, there's a sensitivity with which you talk about these things. And uh, that really pleased me and also made me hopeful. Uh, because uh, usually you all you see is sustainability means going about with the UN Sustainability 17 Development Goals and all that. And then you don't exactly see what's beyond that. It's like you put solar panels on the roof of a house and you call that sustainable development. And like this is a really refreshing, uh, was a really refreshing.